Good morning, everyone. In unison, good morning. Call your next witness. Good morning, Your Honor. Before we get started this morning, we have some records that we want to move into evidence. I've discussed it with Mr. Sanger. And the first set of records involves the documents that have been marked as Exhibits 200 through 218 for identification. We have the Custodian of Records certification from the Turnberry Inn, and we would move at this time that the documents 200 through 218 be admitted into evidence as business records and duly certified. No objection. They're admitted. 200 through 218. In addition to that, Your Honor, we would be moving that the records that are number 255 through 258, which again bear the custodian certification from the Beverly Hilton Hotel, be admitted into evidence as items 255 through 258. No objection. They're admitted. And then one other item of business, Your Honor, that we will complete at the break, but I wanted to bring to the court's attention. We have some records that have been produced pursuant to a subpoena duches tecum from the Calabasas Inn and Country Suites, which are documents 219 through 222. And while there are copies in the court's original, we want to be able to check the ones that came in to make sure they're exactly like the ones that are in the document, and we'll do that during the break. And we'll be offering those later after Mr. Sanger and I have had a chance to review it, but I'd like just a stipulation that the clerk can provide that to us to examine during the course of the break. Do you agree, Mr. Sanger? Yes, Your Honor. All right, that will be the order. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honor. The people call Beverly Wagner. When you get to the witness stand, please remain standing. Look over here, face the clerk, raise your right hand. Yes. Please be seated, state and spell your name for the record. Sure. My name is Beverly Wagner. B-E-V-E-R-L-Y. W-A-G-N-E-R. Thank you. Good morning, Miss Wagner. Good morning. Who do you work for, please? U.S. Bank. What do you do for U.S. Bank? Your microphone, sir. I'm sorry. What do you do for U.S. Bank? I'm the bank manager at the bank. Which bank? Right now I'm at the 4th and Wilshire office. In the year 2003, did you work at a different branch? Yes. What branch was that? The 23rd and Santa Monica branch. And were you branch manager for that particular branch? Yes. That second branch, what is the city that that's located in? Santa Monica. Okay. California. What is the branch that you worked at in 2003? Where was that? What city was that in? 2221 Santa Monica Boulevard in Santa Monica. In Santa Monica, all right. Very good. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm going to show you two exhibits, which appear to be copies of checks. The first one has been marked as People's Exhibit 418, page 3. It appears to be a check from Neverland Valley Entertainment dated April 2, 2003. Do you recognize that check? Yes. How is it that you recognize that check? From the name on the account and the routing number for U.S. Bank, and the account number. All right. Did you participate personally in the cashing of that check as branch manager for U.S. Bank? Yes. And were you working at the Santa Monica branch at that time? Yes. And did you, how is it that you personally participated in the cashing of that check? This is way above the approval limit for a branch manager, and I had to get authority to even cash the check, so it had to come through my hands. How much is that check for? One million dollars. And can you tell me in what manner that check was cashed? In other words, was it deposited? Was it, did the bank disburse those funds in other methods? Tell me exactly how the individual cashed that check. Cash. They walked in with this check and walked out with $1 million in cash? Yes. Did the bank have to make any special arrangements to put together that much money in cash? Yes. How much advance time is necessary for an individual to notify the bank that it will need to have certain funds on hand for a large cash disbursement like this? Objection. Relevance. Overruled. You may answer. A minimum of about seven days. 
All right. What's the exhibit number, counsel? It's 418. 418, page 3. Thank you. All right. I now show you exhibit 419, page 3. Did you also participate in the cashing of that check? Yes. That check is for how much? $500,000. And did the same individual who cashed this first check cash that second check? Yes. Was this check also cashed for currency? Yes. So the individual walked in with this check and walked out with $500,000 in U.S. currency? Yes. The individual who cashed these two checks, what is his name? Fred Schaffel. If I may ask Madam Clerk to help me find a photograph. If I can just have a moment, Your Honor. Miss Wagner, I show you People's Exhibit 16. Do you recognize that individual? Yes. Who is that? Fred Schaffel. Thank you. I have no further questions. Cross-examine? Thank you, Your Honor. Do you want to take your book there? Are the exhibits up there? Yeah. Excuse me one second. May I confer with counsel? Do you have the official exhibit book there? Yes. Off the record discussion held at counsel table. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. Miss Wagner, how are you? I'm good, thank you. You were the branch manager at the second and Santa Monica branch, is that what you said? The 23rd and Santa Monica branch. 23rd. I can't read my handwriting. Sorry. Okay. In any event, is that a branch where Frederick Mark Schaffel had one or more accounts? Yes, sir. How many accounts did he have? I believe it was three. Okay. And you produced records for his accounts, correct? Pardon me? You produced records for his accounts to the court? Um, what? I'm not sure what records you're talking about. Okay. Oh, yes. For, yes, we did. U.S. Bank. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, I believe. The district attorney referred to you at one point as a custodian of records? Yes. Excuse me, so you were responsible for having records sent to the court? Yes, sir. At some earlier time? Uh-huh. And now you've identified two checks. And you're telling us on these two checks, exhibits 418 and 419, page 3 in each one, that you personally participated in those transactions? Yes, sir. So you remember Mr. Schaffel coming in and getting cash for those two checks, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, now, you see my client, Mr. Jackson, sitting there, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, did Mr. Jackson come in the bank? No. Have you ever seen Mr. Jackson before in person? No. All right. Now, with regard to Mr. Schaffel and the records you produced, is it true that in his three accounts during, let's say, the first six months of 2003, that millions of dollars went through his accounts? I'm going to object to reference to records that are not exhibits in this case as well as beyond the scope. Sustained. Well, let's put it this way. You. As the branch manager and as the custodian of records, you reviewed the records before they were sent up here, right? Not fully. Okay. Were you aware that Mr. Schaffel was a customer of the bank? Yes. Okay. And you knew that personally, is that correct? Yes. And you knew it personally in part because you cashed these two checks for him, right? Yes. Did you have other dealings with him? No. So the two times you really remember seeing Mr. Schaffel in person were with regard to these two checks, is that right? Yes. Okay, all right, a little hesitancy, you may have seen them. More than twice, yes. But the two that stick out in your mind were these two, I take it? Yes, sir. I guess what I'm getting at is, to cash these checks, you had to make sure he really was a customer of your bank, right? Yes, sir. All right, and had he been a customer of your bank for a long time? Yes. All right, and during the course of his being a customer for your bank, did you conclude that he was trustworthy as far as dealing with him on these two rather large checks? Yes. Now, 
The checks were drawn on an account that's called Neverland Valley Entertainment, is that correct? Yes, sir. And was it your understanding that Mr. Schaffel was the signator on that account? Yes. Was there anybody else who was a signator on that account? Yes. Who else? Michael Jackson. Did Mr. Jackson ever sign any checks, to your knowledge, or sign any documents whatsoever on that account? Yes. Other than the signature cards? I'm not sure. Objection. Foundation. Sustained. All right. Did you review the records to determine whether or not Mr. Jackson ever signed anything other than the signature cards on that account? No, sir. All right. And you did not verify Mr. Jackson's signature other than it was on the signature card, is that correct? Yes. Okay. In other words, he didn't come in and sign in your presence? No. You ended up looking in your records and you saw a signature card that appeared to have a signature for Michael Jackson, is that right? Yes. All right. And other than that, all of your dealings, as far as you know, were with Frederick Mark Schaffel, is that correct, on these accounts? No. Were there other people that may have come in? Not come in, but that I spoke with. Spoke with. Okay. All right. And you do not know what happened to this money after Mr. Schaffel walked out of the bank with it, is that correct? No. All right. And I have no further questions. Were Michael Jackson and Frederick Mark Schaffel the only two authorized individuals as far as to remove funds from this account? Yes. And you said you spoke to someone else other than Mark Schaffel about these accounts. Who was that? I think at one time I spoke with Michael. Do you remember what that was about? I'm going to object. That calls for hearsay. Calls for hearsay and there's a lack of foundation. Offered as an admission. The objection is overruled. You may answer. Do you remember what that was about? No, not really. Did it have something to do with this account? I'm going to object. That's leading and no foundation. Overruled. You may answer. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. No further questions. All right. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. Call your next witness. The next witness will be Craig Bonner. You may be seated. You're still under oath. Good morning, Sergeant Bonner. Good morning. With respect to your investigation in this case, did you have occasion to gather, sort and analyze telephone records and subscriber information? Yes, I did. Do you see the stack of phone exhibits sitting on council table? I believe they're 450 through 459. Yes, I'm quite familiar with them. Do you recognize those exhibits? I'm quite familiar, yes. And did you play a role in putting those exhibits together and analyzing the information that was contained within them? I did. Can you briefly and generally explain to the jury the process that was used to, the initial step used in getting a handle on the information that's in those exhibits? Yes. Basically we obtained quite a number of telephone records through search warrant and subpoena. We amassed those records and brought them into a computer database, used that computer database to compile and sort those records into a format where we could begin to see patterns of calls and who was calling whom. We then utilized that information to cut out the unnecessary material, or the material which we could not substantiate through other evidence, and we have brought that together now into exhibits that will show just those phone calls that are pertinent, and we have done that in a visual manner as well as in a document that will back up that visual manner. Okay, I think we missed a step. With respect to the information that was generated and you created a spreadsheet from it, can you explain to the jury how you verified the information that was in your spreadsheets? The computer database basically put together a list of the calls that it said occurred between our involved parties to ensure that that list was correct. We then went into those records, which are the actual records sent by the phone companies, and we verified each and every call that the computer said occurred, and we have noted where that call occurs within those records. Okay. Did you prepare some exhibits for court today to demonstrate your testimony? I did. As soon as I finish marking the last of these pages I'll show you the exhibit, okay? I apologize. I'll ask you whether you reviewed the records from the Turnberry Resort, and I'll show you those documents in a minute, while you were conducting your phone analysis? 
That's correct. Did you review records from the Beverly Hilton? And I'll also show you those exhibits in a minute. Yes, I did. Did you examine the record from Huntel with respect to air ground communication for a flight occurring on February 7th of 2003? Yes, I did. Off the record discussion held at council table. Detective Bonner, with the court's permission, I'd like to approach and show you exhibits number 859 through number 882. Excuse me, let me just see what we have here. Off the record discussion held at council table. All right, go ahead. I ask if you recognize exhibit 859? Yes, I do. What does 859 contain? 859 is the visual chart documenting telephone calls between the involved parties on February 5, 2003. Is there also a document behind the visual chart? There is. It's an Excel spreadsheet, which is the verification of each call that is claimed on the visual chart. And did you create or cause to be created these charts? I did. And did you cause to be created 859 through 882? I did. Okay. Now, with respect to testifying about the contents of these exhibits, 859 through 882, did you delegate some other of your colleagues to assist you? I did. And which exhibits will you be testifying to today, if you could please the tell jury now? I will testify to 859, 860, 861, 862, 863, 864, 865, 866, 867, 871, 875, 876, 877, 878 and 879. Okay. With respect to exhibit numbers 859 through 867, are those telephone charts and spreadsheets between the period of February 5th of 2003 and February 16th of 2003? That's correct. Exhibit 871, is that the chart and the spreadsheet for February 20th of 2003? That's correct. And with respect to exhibits number 875 through 879, do those cover the dates of March 5th, 2003, through March 9th of 2003? That's correct. Turning your attention to exhibit number 859, would you briefly describe for us in general terms what is depicted on the chart? This chart depicts a number of calls that occur between various individuals that have came up during this investigation, including Frank Cassio, Mark Schaffel, Jay Jackson, Evelyn Tavashi, as well as a number of telephones that come back registered to the Turnberry Resort in Florida. Okay. And do the numbers and links on that chart accurately reflect the information that you gleaned from the telephone records you've testified about previously? That's correct. And does the information supporting the links you make on chart 859 provided in the Excel spreadsheets an accurate depiction of what is on the charts? That is correct. Your Honor, I would move 859 into evidence at this time. I have a concern about foundation and relevance as to all of the entries, but I'll submit it at this point subject to cross-examination. All right, I'll admit them. I'd ask you the same questions about exhibits 860 through 867. Do each of those charts represent individuals that came up in your investigation, including the people you just mentioned, and link telephone calls between phones registered in their names? That's correct. And do each of those exhibits also contain a spreadsheet supporting the information you placed on the flowchart? That is correct. Your Honor, at this time we'd move 860 through 867 into evidence as well. Same objection, Your Honor. All right, they're admitted. I have the same question about exhibit 871 and exhibits 875 through 879. Do each of the charts in those exhibits accurately reflect the telephone calls between the phones listed on the charts that are connected to individuals in this investigation? And is there an Excel spreadsheet accompanying each chart supporting the information that's in the charts? That's correct. We'd move 871 and 875 through 879 into evidence, Your Honor. Same objection. All right, they're admitted. Madam Clerk. May I have the Turnberry records that were just admitted, please? I believe they're 200. Thank you. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Detective Bonner, I'm going to hand you a binder containing records from the Turnberry, exhibits 200 through 218, and I'd ask if you'd review that. 
And when you're finished, please tell us whether you recognize the contents and whether you used the contents in generating your charts and spreadsheets. I recognize these charts as being the hotel records for the Turnberry Resort. And we utilize these charts in that they are the documents within our charts, in that they contain telephone records. Okay. Do you recognize the exhibits? Yes. Your Honor, may I have input 4, please, and may I publish? Yes. Off the record discussion held at council table. Detective Bonner, I'm going to place on the Elmo what appears to be Exhibit 859. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Just starting in the upper left hand corner, where there's a little telephone symbol and the name, Frank Cassio, can you just give all of us a very general description of what is intended to be depicted in this exhibit? Absolutely. What we have again are a number of individuals whom we have determined through our investigation to be involved or associated with Mr. Jackson, including Mr. Cassio, Mr. Schaffel, Evelyn Tavashi, Chris Carter, Debbie Rowe, and these are the hotels, the Turnberry Hotel records that we have just spoke of, and these are calls between these individuals. Here we have telephones that belong to Frank Cassio, telephones that belong to Mr. Schaffel, and we have indicated that there are nine telephone calls that occurred between telephones belonging to Mr. Cassio and Mr. Schaffel, and each one of these links tells the same information. We have three calls that occurred between telephones belonging to this, which is Evelyn Tavashi's home telephone number, and Frank Cassio's telephone numbers. We have one call that occurred between Jay Jackson's telephone number and Evelyn Tavashi's home telephone number. We have one call that occurred between the presidential suite at the Turnberry, which was under the name of Fred Macy, to Jay Jackson's telephone number. And again, each one of these links tells you that there is a call that occurred between phones belonging to this person in a phone over here, and the number of calls is indicated in the link. Okay, I'm going to put up the first page of the spreadsheet behind the chart for the 5th of February 03. That's part of. That's a part of 859. Part of 859. I'm only going to put up a portion of it, detective, just so we're not publishing a bunch of home numbers. Could you please describe what is intended by the numbers and the headings across this exhibit, please? Okay, starting over on the left, we have this number right here, 702-234-9059. That is a telephone number that came back registered to Christopher Carter, which is indicated in the next one. And then we have the date of the call, which is the 5th of February 2003. We have the time of the call, which is at 2322 hours, 1122 PM. We have the duration of the call, 1 minute. We then have the number that he dialed, 201-213-0763, which comes back registered to Frank Cassio. This is the source of that information that's detailed right here, which is, came from T-Mobile Records. This is the exhibit number which corresponds to one of those exhibits. This is the tab number within that exhibit. And this is the page number at which this record can be found within this exhibit. Okay, so the Chris Carter to Frank Cassio call occurring at 11.22 p.m. on February 5, 2003, is found in the T-Mobile exhibit, which is 452, under the first tab, and under the page marked 11 of 23? That's correct. Is that how all of the entries in all of these spreadsheets work? Fundamentally, different records have different means by which we were able to identify specific calls. Some of them actually had an exact call number to correspond to that call. And in that case we gave that exact call number to go along with it. Okay, did you index the phone calls from the hotel records the same way? Similarly, yes. If I may, counsel, the second page. Same exhibit? Same exhibit. All right. Would you turn to page 2 of your spreadsheet, and please go to the line with the heading, Macy Presidential. What number exhibit is the spreadsheet? This exhibit is also exhibit 859, your honor. Do you see on the bottom line up there? I do. Is that the entry for the presidential suite at the Turnberry Isle Resort? That's correct. I'm going to blow it up just a little bit so we can see portions of it. This doesn't want to focus. Okay. How about we do it like this, detective? Okay. So the time of the call from the Turnberry Isle, from the presidential suite to Major Jackson, occurred at what time in the morning? 0958 hours, or 958 a.m. And that's Florida time, correct? Correct. And when you indexed the hotel records, you referenced the exhibit, correct, 202 in this case. That's correct. 
And then what does the T794, page 6, mean in the last column? T794 is a reference number that is on the documents pertaining to the Fred Macy presidential suite, and page 6 indicates that that particular telephone call is found on page 6 of the documents labeled T794. Okay. Would you turn to the Turnberry exhibit, please, 202, find the page where that phone call is and remove it for me, please. What exhibit number? This is 202, page 6. I'm going to put on the screen exhibit 202, page 6. And the call that you're referring to, is that the first entry for the date of 2 to 5 on this exhibit? Yes, the first telephone call entry. Okay, and that appears to have lasted for 27 minutes? Correct. And is that represented on your chart by the link between Fred Macy Presidential Suite and Jay Jackson? Yes, it is. Okay, I'd like to flip this over to page 5, if I may. These appear to be phone entries for the date of February 4th, correct? That's correct. With respect to the bottom two telephones, telephone entries ending in 6162, one at 1935 hours and one at 2054 hours, do you recognize those numbers from these exhibits? Yes, I do. And who do those belong to? Those belong to David Ventura. That would be Janet Arvizo's parents. Okay. If we could go to the date of February 6th, please. Just have that ready. I'd like to finish discussing these records for the 5th. Finishing up with Exhibit 859, Detective, with your pointer, please, and with respect to the call from, the calls from Frank Cassio to Mark Schaffel, over what period of time did those occur? I'll have to refer back to the spreadsheet. Please do. Okay. The first call I have is in the early morning hours, specifically right before 1 a.m., and the last call I see is after 9 p.m. And did a number of these calls last for two minutes or more? Yes. And did one of them last 15 minutes? Yes. One call at 1 o'clock, a little after 1 p.m. How many times did Mr. Cassio call the home of the defendant's personal assistant, Ms. Tavashi? Three times. And over what period of time did those calls occur? Again, the first call occurred, I'm sorry. The first call occurred at 3.42 p.m. The last call occurred a little after 9 p.m. So those are within the times that Mr. Cassio was ringing Mr. Schaffel? That's correct. Or at least his phone was calling Mr. Schaffel's phone? Correct. Okay. In the bottom left-hand corner, there's a symbol that says, Tavashi, Evelyn, MJJ Prod, Unit 1. Can you explain that for the jury, please? That is a phone record. We took the naming of that right off of the phone record, which is a Nextel record. Is that a telephone number of 310-864-7791? Yes, it is. And are all the calls either going to or coming out of your flowchart for that telephone number, the 7791 number? I'm sorry, what was the question? Are all the numbers going to that unit 1 number and going out to the same number, the 7791 number? Do you understand? You don't. No. The calls from Chris Carter. Okay. To the Unit 1 number, and the calls from Frank Cassio to the Unit 1 number, those are all to the same number, the 7791 number, correct? Correct. The 1 for, that's indicated as Unit 1. Okay. And there are other Tavashi, Evelyn, MJJ production phones later on that have different telephone numbers, correct? Correct. That's why I was asking about this one. The calls in between Chris Carter and the Turnberry Resort and Mark Schaffel going to the link in the bottom right, the Turnberry Isle Resort, are those incoming or outgoing calls? Do you know? Those are both outgoing from the individual, i.e., Mark Schaffel or Chris Carter, going to the Turnberry Resort. Okay. And the Andy Brandon room in the middle, is that the only room where both the Casio phones and the Schaffel phones were connected during this period of time? On that date, that's correct. Can you tell us the period of time in which the calls between Schaffel and the Brandon Room occurred, please? Okay. With regard to Andy Brandon Room to Mark Schaffel, I have the first call at about 10.40 in the morning, and ending at right after 10 p.m. All day long? All day long. With respect to the call between Major Jackson and Evelyn Tavashi's home, can you tell us whether Mr. Jackson called Miss Tavashi or whether it was the other way around? Well, I'm going to object. 
we're referring to an individual making a call as opposed to somebody at one phone calling somebody at another phone. Sustained. With respect to the phone call between the Evi Tavashi phone and the Jay Jackson phone, can you tell us which way that call went? Okay, that was Evelyn Tavashi's telephone calling Jay Jackson's telephone. And how long did that, how long was that call? Three minutes. And was that after the call between the Fred Macy presidential suite and the Jay Jackson phone? That appears to be prior to. In Pacific time or Eastern time, Sergeant Bonner. That would have been Pacific time. So it's listed as 727 Pacific time? It actually, yeah, 727 AM Pacific, which would be after, I'm sorry. Okay, so the call from the presidential suite came first, and then the call from the Tavashi home came second? That's correct. Okay, if you could please turn to exhibit 860. I'm going to put this chart up. And briefly if you could summarize this chart for the jury, using your laser. Okay, as with the previous date, we're again showing the connections of telephone calls between telephones belonging to various individuals identified throughout this investigation. Again, we have Frank Cassio, Mark Schaffel, Evelyn Tavashi, Christopher Carter, Hamid Moslehi, David Ventura, that's Janet Arvizo's parents, Jay Jackson, Deborah Rowe, and again, telephones at the Turnberry Resort. Can you tell us, please, when the first call between the Casio phone and the Shaffle phone occurred? The first call that I have between the Casio phone and the Shaffle phone occurs slightly before 1 a.m. at 0039 hours. And your chart indicates there were 19 calls between the two phones? That's correct. And did those last essentially throughout the day? Yes. The last call occurred a few minutes before midnight at 2,351 hours. With respect to the calls between the Casio phone and the rooms named Stressler and Franklin at the Turnberry, starting with the Stressler room, can you tell us whether that was incoming or outgoing? It's an outgoing call from the Stressler room to Frank Casio's telephone. What about the Franklin room? Again, that would be an outgoing call from the Franklin room to the Casio telephone. And the calls between the Brandon room and the Shaffle phone? That is an outgoing call from the Brandon room to Shaffle's telephone. Do you have a time for the phone call between the Shaffle phone and the Deborah Rowe phone? 2116 hours. Which direction was that call going? That was from Deborah Rowe to Mark Shaffle's telephone. Okay. From Ms. Rowe's phone to Mr. Shaffle's phone? That's correct. You show two calls between the Shaffle phone and phones registered to David Legrand? Correct. And can you tell us when the first phone call was? The first phone call was at 1.48 p.m. And how long did that last? Five minutes. And the second phone call? Was at 2.30 p.m., again for five minutes. Okay. With respect to the calls from the Gavin Franklin room to Janet's parents and the Jay Jackson phone, it's a little blurry from here. Can you tell us how many calls there were from the Franklin room just to Janet's parents? There were eight calls. Were there two rooms registered under Gavin? Correct. Okay. And in your Excel spreadsheet, did you separate the rooms out? Yes, we did. Do you know how many calls came from either room, and if you could give us the room designation? There are two room designations. One would be T597, the other would be T309. With regard to T-597, I have six of those calls to the Venturus's residence coming from T-597, and I have two of the calls coming from T-309. Is room T-597 Exhibit 216 in the Turnberry book? That's correct. Would you please remove the page that contains the phone calls you're referring to? Sergeant Bonner, I'm going to put page 1 of Exhibit 216 on the board and I'll blow that up. Okay. The calls, at least two of the calls, between room T597 registered under Gavin Franklin, are those right in the middle of the exhibit? Yes, right here. Okay, and the first call lasted four minutes and the second one four minutes? Correct. Okay, and those are the first phone calls for the sixth, correct? Correct. Showing you page two of the same exhibit. The last call to the 6162 number on the 6th is 1153 p.m., top line? Yes, all this is. This one appears to be at straight up midnight, so depending on which day you want to count that one to. I count midnight as tomorrow. Either one. 
That will work. Okay. And then the bottom three numbers, those are J. Jackson? Correct. And they're dated 2 to 6, but clearly they occur after midnight, right? Correct. So did you put those on the charts for 2 to 7? I would have put these on 2 to 7, that's correct. Can you tell us, please, at what time the Casio phone and the phone registered to Mr. Jackson's personal assistant, Ms. Tavashi, what time those occurred? The first call occurred at 5.34 p.m., the second call at 8.17 p.m. And shortly after getting, shortly after the phone call between Casio and Tavashi, after the first one, were there two calls immediately to Mr. Schaffel, 1750 and 1757? I'm going to object, again. To the Schaffel phone, excuse me. No foundation. I'll rephrase. Is that the same objection as using the phone instead of the person? Yes, sir. All right, sustained. There are actually several numbers as well. Okay. Between, let me start this over. After the phone calls between the Casio phone and the Tavashi phone, were there two phone calls immediately following to the Shaffle phone from the Casio phone? There were two calls, one to one number associated with Shaffle and another to another number associated with Shaffle. The first one at 1750. The second one at 1757 hours, are 550 and 557 p.m. Okay, so the 557 one lasted for seven minutes? That's correct. If we could turn to exhibit 861, those are phone calls occurring on the 7th of February, correct? That's correct. Okay, again, you've mapped calls from the Turnbury out to other individuals? Correct. There is a Fred Macy, regular room, kind of in the middle of this exhibit. Can you explain to us what you mean by that? There were two different rooms that were registered to Fred Macy. One was the presidential suite that cost several thousand dollars a night. There was also a Fred Macy room that was a room that cost about $400 a night, which is what all of the other rooms cost. These are two separate records, and to designate that, we had Fred Macy Presidential and Fred Macy Regular Room. Okay, and the calls from the, the rooms, the individual rooms at the Turnbury and the phone registered to Mr. Christopher Carter, were all those outgoing calls? No, they are, with the exception of this call right here, where there's one call. That is an incoming call from Carter's, or a telephone associated with Carter to the Turnberry Isle Resort. Okay, but the individual rooms are all outgoing calls, correct? Correct. You can't see incoming calls on the individual room bills, isn't that right? No. Okay, and the Turnberry Isle Resort number, that's the main line? Yes. The calls from Shaffle, the Shaffle phone, excuse me, to the Turnberry Isle Resort, are all those going from Shaffle to the Turnberry Isle? This specific connection right here, these are calls from Shaffle to the Turnberry. However, these two are not. Okay, and the call from the Chris Franklin room to Neverland Valley Ranch, can you tell us whether that occurred before or after the outgoing call to the Chris Carter phone? You can look at your records. Let me just clarify that. Do you want to know whether or not this call here occurred before or after that call there? No. There are two calls coming out of the Chris Franklin room, correct? Correct. One to the Neverland Valley Ranch? Okay. Okay. And the other one to the Chris Carter phone? Correct. Which one occurred first, please? Okay. The first call occurred to the Neverland Valley Ranch at 9.06 a.m. What time was the second call? It occurred at 8.03 p.m. I placed in front of you exhibit number 850. Do you recognize that document? Yes, I do. What is that? This is a billing record for air-to-ground telephone calls that occurred on an extra jet flight on February 7, 2003. And does it appear that calls were made from that flight to the phone registered to Janet's parents? Yes, there were three calls. And did those occur in time after the 10 calls from the Gavin Franklin rooms to the phone at Janet's parents? The telephone calls on the airplane occurred after the telephone calls from the Gavin Franklin room. Okay. Do those, did they occur? Did the phone calls from the aircraft occur after the phone calls from the Gavin Franklin rooms to the J. Jackson phone? They occurred after. And were there also phone calls placed from that aircraft to numbers registered to Neverland Valley Ranch? Yes, there were. Two of them? Yes. And how long did those calls last? 
I have one for one minute, and one for two minutes. And the three calls that were placed from the aircraft to the phone at Janet's parents' house, were they interspersed with the calls to the Neverland phone or did one group come before the other? They were interspersed. Sergeant Bonner, if you could turn to exhibit number 862, please, and the supporting chart. That's two to eight? Two to eight. Do you have this? If you could please describe each one of the phones and monikers you've given them on this exhibit, please, two to eight. Exhibit 862 for February 8th of 2003. Okay, starting in the top left, we have a cellular telephone that came back. The record said, indicated MJJ Productions, Miko Brando. We then had another phone that came back to Evelyn Tavashi, MJJ Productions, Unit 1. This one came back to just MJJ Productions, Evelyn Tavashi, without a unit number. This was a telephone registered to Christopher Carter. These were telephone lines that came back to Neverland Valley Ranch. These are telephone lines that came back to Mark Schaffel. Telephones associated with Debbie Rowe. Telephones associated with Frank Cassio. Telephones associated with Vincent Amen. Telephones associated with Christian Robinson, under the business name Site LLC. And a telephone associated with Rudy Provencio. With respect to the contacts between the Casio phone and the Vince Amen phones, if you could find those in your records, please. Okay, I have those. Could you tell us what time the first call between those two phones occurred? The first time is 11.13 a.m. And that was a call for three minutes? Correct. Which direction did it go? From Amen to Casio. And the second phone call? Occurred at 2.47 p.m., again, from Amen to Casio. And that was a one-minute call, correct? Correct. With respect to the call between the Casio phone and the Neverland Valley Ranch number, would you tell us what time that occurred? The first call occurred at 5, correction, 11.48 a.m. The call between the Chris Carter phone and the Neverland Valley Ranch phone, can you tell us what time that occurred, please? At 4, or, correction, 2.44 in the morning. Was there a call between the Casio phone and the phones at Neverland Ranch at around that same time? That's correct. There was a call at 2.34 a.m. from Neverland Ranch to Casio. And that showed as an incoming call on Mr. Casio's phone record, correct? That's correct. All right, we'll take our break.